What is going on, everybody? It is a glorious day here on the Glorious Sunrise Podcast with myself. I'm Kevin, and we got John with us again today. John, how you doing, buddy? Doing great, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Um, I'm before... glad you uh, glad you said my name, though. That way I didn't forget it this time. I got you. It's hard to remember right, our own name sometimes, you know? <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> you just don't say it that often. Um, no. Guys, today we are going to be talking a little bit about the new Capenna Championship that happened, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. Uh, we're going to be going through the top eight deck lists and, and all that stuff and kind of discussing some of the things that we're noticing as the meta has kind of, I mean, truthfully, this is our really big first touch point on where the meta is landing, at least for traditional standard. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at that, see some of the trends that we're expecting and all that. Uh, and then, of course, go into detail on some of these deck lists. We'll try not to go through every single one because we'll end up taking up all the time. But uh, we will talk about some of that. But first and foremost, I just want to reiterate to you guys, if you're listening here on YouTube or wherever, you can listen to this on the Spotify app as well as the podcast app. Feel free to follow us there. That way you get notified, of course, when the new episodes come out. It is Monday at 6 a.m. Eastern time every single week. Uh, and we do have a blast with this. So John and I really get to delve deep into some topics and have a blast. Uh, and John, you've been streaming with us for the last couple of weeks. So how are you enjoying it? Man, I love it, dude. How is that community, bro? That's They're just so <laughs> much fun. <laughs> they're, they are. And what's, what cracks me up is with the, with the direct challenges and stuff, they just get in there and they just feed the whole. I mean, I, I don't know that streaming's ever been this easy. I really don't because I just got to talk to them and they're there to play and they're there to win. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of fun. Some of them are brutal in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my they, gosh. Yeah, it gets crazy, man. We yeah. have some matches. Uh, you know, you get land floods and droughts and stuff like that from game to game. But yeah, some of them sure. games just my mind's melted by the time I'm done. <laughs> well, it's I an absolute it, blast having you here. And uh, again, guys, if anybody isn't aware, John is streaming now with It Resolves full time Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Is that correct? Yep, seven okay. and nine Central Time. I get it mixed up because we're in different time zones, so I have to make sure I'm, you know, getting it at the right time. But uh, go hang out with them. You can challenge John directly uh, in whatever format, whatever deck you want to use. Just give him a heads up so he can, you know, face face you with a, a reasonable deck on the other end. But uh, it's a blast. I've been popping in every once in a while, and I I really enjoy it. The first one especially was an absolute blast. We got a lot of people oh, yeah. to hang out and beat your butt um anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah man no it is it's a lot of fun and the whole other you know the whole format open yeah, yeah it's man you got to slide from from standard to historic to, yeah, to explore gotta... to alchemy man it's a lot of fun though it really is these are things that i wouldn't normally hit unless they weren't driving it but it, yeah. it has been man it has been a lot of fun good very happy to hear that and thank you to everybody who is participating in those streams and hanging out with us um it is an absolute blast to be able to do this on the channel so thank you to you as well john um yep. like i said guys at the top of the episode we are talking about new capenna championship we're going to be going through the top eight a little bit before we do that i just want to kind of call out the the top eight winners here and just say a huge congratulations to everybody who played but especially the top eight Jan Merkel was the top winner of the whole thing. Uh, congratulations to you, my friend. Uh, there are a couple other big names that I noticed in the top eight, like Mike Sigrist, uh, Shada Yosuoka. All these kinds of people are, are really, really working hard to get those wins. So congratulations to everybody who made it through the top eight. Uh, like I said, we are going to talk about some of the deck lists and all that stuff, but we're gonna. I think we'll start kind of high level and saying, okay, with this top eight, we have got, if I'm not mistaken, if my math is correct, basically six completely different deck lists uh, mm -hmm. out of the full eight. So two of them were kind of repeated, those two being Esper, Rafine, and Jund. Uh, but overall, I mean, in the top eight alone, we did get to see kind of a variety of deck lists. And I think as we dig deeper, we'll see, you know, some variety in the card selection, things like that, some very obvious things uh, that, that show us where the meta is right now. But how did you feel about the flexibility, the variety of the decks that we saw? For me personally, um, you know, some of them really good i like yeah. seeing the interesting takes especially with like the esper mid-range esper aggro and stuff like that and we're seeing some of the 
the streets of new Capenna cards fit into other stuff like uh, just guy storm got big score over unexpected windfall but unexpected windfalls in it in there too so my deck's not out of it yet my deck is not out of it yet you got this there's still time (laughs) there's still time guys i'm telling (laughs) you um but uh no i think the jund list and uh maybe the grixis vampire list those were uh those were probably the big shakeups with uh streets of nuka penna had a lot of ads and stuff but uh no i liked it man there was variety all over the place i mean at least we didn't just see you know enchants or mono white stuff that works really well in arena but tournament man you got to be flexible and you got to be able to adapt and you got to have the deck styles that can do that as well right so i liked it well and you know to that point this is something that we you and i actually talked about when the meta or like first episode of glorious sunrise when we were talking about streets of new capenna that this opens up because it's a three color format now uh where Mm -hmm. you're seeing a lot more three color flexibility and support in the land slot with the the triumphs we're seeing a lot more, obviously, three-color decks hitting the top of the meta. I mean, Jeskai, Esper, Naya, Grixis, you know, all these Jund, all these decks are focused around three colors. Now, maybe one's more of a splash than a full-on, like, include, but we're still seeing a lot of three-color decks hit the table right now. And what that allows for is we'll kind of go through and see when we delve deep into the actual cards that were chosen, um, is that... You know, even if you look at both Jun lists in the top eight as an example, they're vastly different lists in what they're including. And certainly there are some cards that are foundational to that color combination. And certainly you're going to see those in most of the decks that feature those colors. However, um, even just in the land slot alone, you can look at the differences. But then, of course, throughout the rest of the deck, you're seeing a lot more, you know, variety of decision making and do you play this number of the Wandering Emperor versus this number of the Wandering Emperor, or whatever it might be, whatever card it might be. Uh, And even in the the interaction slots, it seems like people can't decide what the exact right number of anything is. And I think that that's kind of a good thing because that means we're seeing a little bit more differentiation. That's a good word. That's a... That's a ten dollar word. One, That's um, wow. <laughs> that was solid. I just pulled that one out. Um. Anyway, uh, you're seeing a lot of like variation in these slots, and I think that you know, for a regular standard environment, we have. That's a really good thing because it just means that we're not seeing the like. Okay, just pick a deck list, and you know, to our topic last week and talking about net decking you're not seeing the the pro level players just pull a deck list and say this is the best one you're seeing them as we expected go through and really tech it out to the the specifications that they seem to want um and again even in the land slot i was looking and some of them are playing the legendary lands for the effects but not all of them because they want more flexibility it's there's a lot of decision making going into standard right now yeah no i agree uh there is the one thing that i really noticed that stood out though is uh aggro is heavy right now we talked about it we we touched on this too um and we don't have a control deck that's completely floated to the top yet i mean just guy storm probably comes the closest to it with the negates and the juaries disruptions and stuff and it was number one so i think um i think we still haven't seen the meta yeah, I think this is the start of it. Yes. And people are trying to figure out what, you know, the mid range decks and what's the best way to go about it Completely to navigate agree. the field. But uh, I think uh, I think the field's wide open for a control deck just to come in and absolutely stomp. I agree. Stomp. And, this. You know, to your point, we saw just, just for those of you who don't know, uh, first of all, we're getting all of our information in terms of card lists and, you know, the top eight placements and all that stuff. That's all an MTG top eight if you guys aren't aware go there. You can check out all the details of any given tournament, but in particular this one. Jeskai Hinata was the winner, uh, which is a really interesting list in my opinion. We'll talk about some of the changes there later on, but almost a one for one. I mean, this one's is it, but yours was Jeskai, but the the is it control list that placed fifth at the hands of David uh, is very similar to the deck that you created, and that's, that's that control list, the Lear control list that we've seen you know, for some time now, there's not too much of a difference there. Um, we mm-hmm. did see if I'm not, I was going through the deck list to see if there's any like major streets of new Capenna cards that have been added. And like, I really don't see any, there is a couple of things in the sideboard and that's like it. 
I mean, it's all basically the same deck, and it still made it to the top eight, which is interesting. Oh, you're talking about David Ingle's deck? The yeah. Just High Storm? Yeah, yeah. Man. And look, if you watch the first two days of that tournament, he was just absolutely ripping through everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, he ended up in eighth place with, uh, with uh, I think it was, what, six and one? Yeah, I, I think, think I think Sunday was only – I think Sunday was just the uh, – to find out who the top eight was, and I think that was standard, I, I believe – when I watch, I think Saturday was historic and I can't yeah. even remember what Friday was. I don't know if it was draft or historic as well, but, uh, yeah, in the standard game, um, it did really well. It did yeah. really well. And, yeah. uh, I'm glad to see he placed in the top eight because he was shredding the field oh, yeah. for the first two days. So yeah, but, uh, you're right. It didn't change a whole lot. I think, um, yeah, big score definitely, works a whole lot better than unexpected windfall which is yeah. something we tried to explain him before i still see people running for unexpected windfall and never see a big score now if they all sink to the bottom of the deck that's one thing but uh look and uh you got one red over two reds yeah. uh it's easier it's easier to manifest the one red well and it's so, so important in a deck that's focused on treasure especially because a lot of times you know you get to a situation where because you're generating treasure is a pretty significant mana source for yourself if you don't mm. have to use that extra treasure just to hit the double red like that's such a big play in that deck because you want every ounce of mana that you can get out of it for the later turns of the game and so just that slight efficiency i know it doesn't seem like much especially to someone who might just be coming into the game like this is their first introduction to standard and they're like why does that matter i'm telling you it matters like that is such a big efficiency thing and it's so easy i mean it's just a replacement you know what i mean you don't it, yeah it's well easy. you'll find out how much it matters when you land two islands and only one mountain in your yes. opening hand yeah yeah <laughs> so then exactly. you're like man i really wish i had big score yes absolutely. yeah i bet you do either that or you're hoping for another mountain on yeah. your pulls in the next three turns yeah. but uh no nah, man i was i was surprised i wouldn't okay i wasn't surprised to see it where it landed it's a good deck yeah. however i was surprised to see somebody actually take it in but i like it man. yeah i like it it's, it's a good deck list. it's fun it's kind of i wouldn't say it's janky but it's got so many interactions and then yeah. the triggers and I, i'm interaction and trigger junkie so oh, of course you are uh fits my play style <laughs> it fits <laughs> my play style i like it, it man but um yeah uh, but to your point, though, we did see we did see one card in particular from Streets of New Capenna make waves, and that is Rafine. Rafine, yeah. So in two of the top eight deck lists, uh, and really leading the charge with this Esper deck, it's a full four in both, uh, which on its own says a lot, being that it is a legendary creature and you can't obviously have more than one out at any given time. Uh, it's a powerhouse, man. And I, I've, I've been facing it on the best of one ladder quite a bit. And uh, man, it's a it's a pain in the butt to deal with that card. <laughs> it's so frustrating. And I think it speaks very well to the meta right now, which is, you know, a couple of things. One, it has a big butt. That four toughness for three mm -hmm. mana outpaces a lot of the removal spells that you're seeing, especially the point and shoot removal spells like burn spells, things like that. Not only that, but it puts them off pace because there's a ward cost attached to it. And not only that, but it gets out from cards like Meat Hook Massacre because that big butt keeps it out of range. And so it's one of those that's just like, surprisingly, I mean, ward one doesn't seem like a lot, but it turns out to be a really big hit. And like, it's so frustrating. And the fact that it connives and, and can lead to other, you know, power plays and stuff like that. It's just like, it will never easily be removed. Uh, not unless you just infernal grasp and you got nothing else to do with that extra mana up like great but <laughs> the deck is built to kind of deal with that yeah well in the easy spot removal vanish and verse can't hit it yeah just because of the multi uh the multicolored no man it is it's an absolute pain in the ass but it's an absolute <laughs> you got to answer it oh, as yeah. soon as it hits the board so it's kind of doing several things on several fronts one it's going to draw you cards it's just going to get bigger if you want or make your other creatures bigger um it's got flying <laughs> it's got the ward cost it's got all kinds of evasion going on uh if you let it get out of control you know it's just it's it's a pain you're yeah. you're just gonna lose the game but on the other front 
you got to answer it right away. So even if you do lose your Rafine, you're you're just kind of uh, you know taking the fuel out of your opponent's hands so they yeah. can answer it. Well, and they're doing it inefficiently because of that ward cost, and so there's there's very it's very unlikely to hit. You know, if if you get this down on turn three as an example, and they infernal grasp it the next turn for whatever you're basically just saying like, okay, that's all you're going to do that turn. You're not going to be able to play anything else if you hit it on curve. And so um, it really slows things down and kind of plays that aggressive role. So it's a, it's a tricky card to deal with. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see much more of this Esper Rafine deck hitting higher up on the, the ladders and things like that over the coming weeks. I think it's such a great deck. Um, again, having played against it, it's very difficult. I'd like to play it very soon. Um, but actually need a couple more Rafines in my arena to make this work. So we'll get there. But <laughs> right on. I have, I, I'm a little confused about the deck that won. I'll be honest. How did Hinata take the win? Nobody's running control for it. I guess not. Like, Nobody's it's running crazy control to me for it, that and Hinata everybody, won it. Everybody forgets Hinata taxes yeah. the opponent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, Everybody plays into one open island when all they need for a negate now, once Sonata's on the board, is one open island. Yes. You know, it's just, it's sneaky, man. It's sneaky. Uh, but uh, really well built deck. But oh, yeah, yeah, it's just people didn't have an, an, enough answers running for Hanada. And plus, I, even with the. Even with the meat hook, you got to be setting on six lands to get it in Hanada 4 4, right? Yeah, it's a 4 4. Plus, I mean, there's a lot of because you've got negates and you've got in the list that uh jan ran make disappear made an appearance which i think is kind of interesting but i saw that yeah. kind of a cool little include there but it, i mean it's basically a a spell pierce on like steroids because one it counters anything um it's a soft mm -hmm. counter for those of you who don't know it's casualty one so you can double it but um you have the it counters the spell unless the controller pays two uh which is fine that's not like normally that's not a great card but when you only need to leave up one blue mana because you have hanada down plus you can double it with something else like that now becomes a pretty hard counter to anything that's going to deal with the hanada and um you know once you get hanada down and save it for the next turn you're mm -hmm. you're pretty well able to take over that game especially with magma opuses uh, even gold span dragon in there to be able to get some more attacks in like there's just so much powerhouse stuff in this deck um, and the march of swirling misplay has always been a classic now with Hinata. Yeah. it's just so stupid but i don't know man it's a uh, i just do we feel like jeskai Hinata is actually that good or do we feel the meta wasn't prepared for it uh I think he hit it right there. I don't think the meta was prepared for it. I okay. think everybody was focused, and and we did. We touched on it perfectly for for it to kind of level out the way it did in this tournament. Yeah. Um, everybody was focused on the aggro. Yeah. What's the aggro? What's the mid range? Yeah. Um, and what's funny about this field is mono white doesn't stand up to it because the decks that we're seeing like the esper mid-range or the jund uh can actually outpace man uh mono white yeah with uh the treasures and the life gains and stuff like that but also your creature values are a lot higher in the mid-range game where mono white does the full you know let me get all my answers and all my value yes. in the first four turns now you know <laughs> speaking of mono white and just something that i found really interesting was that uh and i think it was in the grixis aggro list yeah so i mm -hmm. i faced a card on the ladder the other day that i was like why are we running this and then I, I realized after you and i had chatted that obviously the tournament had just happened and people were copying deck lists and all that stuff and it was <laughs> the grixis aggro list that mike Sidr sigrist had played and there was a one of ray of enfeeblement which i felt was such a weird call for like the best of mm -hmm. one ladder because I mean, not everybody's playing mono white, so a lot of times it's not a dead card, but it, it lands pretty close to a dead card for a lot of decks. Um, but Ray of Enfeeble Enfeeblement, for anybody that doesn't know, it's one black, instant speed. Uh, target creature gets minus four, minus one until the end of the turn, but if that creature is white, it gets minus four, minus four until the end of the turn. Now, when I read that, I think that's a sideboard card. Like, that's a great addition right. against a white deck. It's phenomenal. Does deal mm -hmm. with things like Rafine. Uh, if you can pay that extra one right. for a turn, it 
connives, so you got to be careful with it. But it does deal with certain things. But as a main deck, like, mm -hmm. that just goes to... Sh I think that's such a tell as to where the meta has been over the last few weeks. That, like, people just do not want to lose to mono-white aggro. Or any white aggro, for that matter. Yeah, no, look, Raven Raven is a good card. It, it, it'll answer Prosperous Innkeepers, Gallagreeters. Sure. Um, but know, only for know, a short time rabbit. with the Gallagreeter. Right. Because you but get the 1-1 one, one counters. Yeah, if you put them on there, I'm always bad about just taking the treasures, man. Let me. I try and be so. <laughs> I so one thing that I've I've learned with Gallagreeters because you know in playing and I think it was the Naya Agro list. Um, yeah, I had four Gallagreeters, so I played that last week. And one of the things that I noticed is like, so I'm with you. When I first started playing with Gallagreeters, I was like, treasure token, treasure token, treasure token. I want to play everything. But there are a lot of occasions where getting that treasure token is super helpful mm -hmm. or not helpful at all and so in those instances i've tried to really recognize okay what's my next turn's play like does does doing this open up a play for me for the next turn or is it really just like a, a more mana for the sake of more mana you know what i'm saying and i've learned that there are more times than not i'm actually not getting the treasure token anymore and playing gallic readers which is funny <laughs> Yeah, as as we're progressing with it and getting used to the uh, mechanics of it, or, or not even the mechanics, the choices, I guess, of it, um, I do. I find myself being more strategic with it now too. Uh, that was just me at the at the beginning. Yeah. But uh, one thing that uh, to bounce back it to uh, Ray of Enfeeblement sure, is of uh, wipes out a Hanada. It does wipe out a Hanada if you can land it. Because it's, right. I mean, it's cheap, so it's easy to get around a lot of the soft counters, but like Negate, as an example, you know, there mm -hmm. are, Hinata's well tooled out to kind of protect the Hinata uh, as mm -hmm. best it can. And so, it, I'm with you, it definitely answers it, but it can be a bit tricky, no matter no matter how you answer Hinata, it can be a bit tricky, so. Oh yeah, no, Hinata's just an absolute pain in the ass, man. Yeah. Um, maybe a good reason to bring soul shatter back in uh yeah. you still got to get around the gates and stuff but either that or board wipes and that was something you know we didn't see a lot of we didn't see a lot of decks running board wipes and right. stuff other than me hook massacre but that's why i think it's set up for a control deck to make uh to make some headroom here in the next tournament uh, because the whole field just kind of showed that they were aggro and uh kind of can trippy with the uh with the storm and the hanada decks but uh i do want to say too i don't we we talked about rafine because rafine was you know it's esper rafine it's yeah. it the main face of the esper decks that popped up but uh i think the newest card that saw the most play was uh the mvp would be a uh, tenacious underdog man oh man yeah what a card. He's all over the place. All over the place. He's a pain in the ass to get rid of. He can pop <laughs> in and draw cards. You know, it's, yeah, that card's amazing, bro. He really is. Like, I mean, you really have to, and I'm learning this from a lot of different places, but you really have to be able to exile stuff in today's meta, um, specifically because of things like Tenacious Underdog. Um, you know, Blood on the Snow is always a factor that's been around for a while. Um, I... I used the Grixis aggro list that Mike Sigris played the other day, and I uh, I found myself up against two different, completely different style reanimator lists. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm realizing that, you know, there are so many strategies that are enabled right now that it's it's one of those scenarios where you just have to have an answer for everything. And I think we're seeing that a lot in the deck list that we're seeing, because, you know, you click on like an Esper Rafine deck or the Grixis aggro deck or whatever, those decks are running board sweepers in the form of Meat Hook Massacre, yet they're an aggro deck. And I get mm -hmm. Meat Hook Massacre is a very unique sweeper in that it also features a way to kind of kill your opponent if you can get them down low enough and all that. But it's also just like, it feels weird to me to run an aggro deck with a sweeper in it. It's like, but you have to. I mean, you literally have to. Yeah, it was probably my best pick ever. Yeah. Before I even came over here, it's when uh, when I, it was what Midnight Hunt, right? Um, uh, yeah. And I called it my favorite card. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. I who knew I was no Sir Jamas, you know? Look but you, um, <laughs> but uh, it is unique in the fact that you can do a sweeper. 
I think it fits really well in an aggro shell though, because it's, it's also, you got to look at it uh, the way I always describe it. You're either going to be using it as a sweeper or you're going to be using it as insurance. Sure. And if you lower it down onto the field for zero and you're already wide, then whether you could meat hook out your opponent to death or not, maybe you get them within two to three of their life total Mm -hmm. uh, just by protecting your own board. So now they can't really sweep. Now they got to be even more aware of what they're doing when they're trying to to uh, to kind of reset the board state. They can't just go in and just throw down a doom scar and wipe it out because you may take them too low. And if you've got a tenacious underdog, you know, you take them down to two, three life and that thing doesn't get exiled, then you just blitz it in and you take out the rest of it. Well, now, and, do you think the existence of Meat Hook Massacre is part of why we aren't seeing, as uh, you know, especially if you look at this top eight, we're not seeing cards like Doom Scar. We're not seeing heavy, you know, tr- I'll say traditional control decks for the sake of a, mm-hmm. or, or for lack of a better term. Sorry, my dog is under here and just shook oh, for fine. no reason. Uh, but you know, is that why you think we don't necessarily see like Doom Scar making an appearance in the top eight right now because of opposing Meat Hook Massacres? Because I, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that, you know, we're in the first few weeks of the meta, and as you and I have talked about, aggro decks are certainly taking the front end of the, the meta right now. It would have been a power play to say, like, nah, I'm just going to bring sweepers, I'm going to sweep, and you guys can't do a thing. You know, there's something to that, but those mm-hmm. those aggro decks are running meat hook massacres for exactly the reason that you stated. Is that part of why we didn't really see control decks either doing well or in existence really at all for this? No, I think it still goes back to what we touched on last week was uh, I don't think control still knows where it wants to go yet. Okay. Uh, you kind of got to, I mean, the, the field's open and everybody's leaning into the aggro decks and they're really good. But yeah. I got to tell you, man, I was sitting there watching this tournament going, man, I really wish somebody would have brought in that Orzov Planeswalker deck. <laughs> that we featured yeah, on the made, channel yeah, so yeah sick. because i think it would have just slaughtered Decimated. this build yeah oh yeah because then even with the hanada deck i mean yeah sure you've got some stuff but you're eventually going to run out and that deck it just doesn't that, run that out. planeswalker control deck that did deck not run is, out of nothing that deck is planeswalkers and sweepers and like that's it that's it <laughs> that's it don't need anything else. No. Um, no, I think it would have done fantastic. I think that was a brilliant control build um, that Thea gave us. But uh, yeah, shout out to Thea I, for building a sick. Deck. Yeah, again, Jesus, I still can't quit talking about that deck. Um, <laughs> it, it blows my mind that one of the best control decks I've seen probably in the past two months doesn't even have blue. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I just don't think we saw a control deck because nobody really knows to go with control. And that is the control game for anybody that plays it. Uh, you can try and build it, but until the meta settles yeah. and, and you know, you got a clear view of what you're expecting, then you can start making your control strategies to that. And I think it's so wide right now. Uh, we've said it before. I'll say it again. We got, uh, we got, and we got really lucky with neon dynasty and streets of Capenna. I'm not saying they're the best sets of all time, but they may be in contention for maybe top three best back to back sets. Cause they went yeah. so wide. Yeah, they really did. I think, you know, to that point, Kamigawa did a great job of kind of setting a tone and then Streets of New Capenna just took that to the next level because now we've got so much flexibility. And I know, you know, we were talking, I know uh, on one of the podcast episodes, I believe, that we talked about previously, we were talking about this flexibility and the fact that, you know, we've got so much now that we can do that the meta is probably going to shift towards three color in a lot of the, the tier one decks. And I think we're seeing that at least at this current stage of the meta, we're certainly seeing that come to fruition. But um i also know there was some speculation on that like there were some people saying and i don't want to call anybody out because you know it's just an opinion it's not a big deal but i know i talked to a couple of individuals who were saying well yeah you know the support's there but you still want that streamlined build we're probably still going to stick with two color for the most part and all that stuff and you know obviously is it control hit the top five here but that's the only two color deck that we saw everything else was Mm -hmm. three color and i with the tools that we have why wouldn't you you know what i mean like you're building in that stuff anything you need you probably have the ability to play it right now um and so it's like you get so much flexibility you get so much like 
much more decision making going on versus the like relatively stricter builds that we have seen in previous standards. And I'm so thankful for that to because going back to the top of the episode, we're talking about that flexibility and the the difference the difference between a lot of deck lists. That's what keeps us from a super stale standard. So let's keep that going. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we need yeah. that. No doubt, no doubt. No, I love it right now, man. It is. It's. Uh, I'm a brewer at heart. I'll yeah. never. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm competitive. I want to win, but uh, I'm <laughs> you not. You know. There. <laughs> I'm not sitting there grinding the ladder uh, just to make mythic. I've done it twice and it was a pain in the ass both times. Yeah. But uh, I like to brew. I like yeah. to brew and I like to try to find new interactions or I get something stuck in my head and maybe I got to play 10 games to pull it off once, but I'm going to laugh really hard one time. <laughs> um, so I, I really love how the field is right now. I'm not bored at all no. at any given time. Um, but uh, there are some things that stuck out to me other than just the new ones popping up. Yeah. Uh, we, we still got to consider rotations coming in September. It is. Um, we've still got a Zika's chariot everywhere and that thing's yeah. going to be gone. Uh, Luminarch aspirant didn't make that much of a splash this weekend, but it's still in a lot of decks. And I mean, I it's in the Esper I, Rafine deck for yeah, good reason. It's, it's in Esper and it's in the mono whites. And I've even seen some angels list run it, yeah, uh, or Zob angels it. list, which makes no sense to me. I don't like uh, it. Angels has got enough stuff to pack into it yeah, right now. It you don't need the aspiring, <laughs> but, no. uh, uh, the other thing that stuck out to me other than, you know, we, we are going to see Aspire and Chariot go away. Yeah. But the other thing that stuck out to me with a lot of these deck lists is uh, I think we hit it kind of, you know, the nail on the head is when this rotation happens, Kaido was not the Planeswalker to take over the plane, best Planeswalker slot. It will be the Wandering Emperor. She is that good. Oh, yeah. Wandering Emperor is incredible <laughs> in so many different capacities. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of it is down to the fact that you can play at instant speed with her. Um, there is so much that so many plays that that opens up that it's, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and I find myself, you know, with the wandering emperor, cause it's a classic play where, you know, say you're up against like, uh, any deck right now is going to be able to run some amount of removal slash burn or whatever. And so you have to consider so heavily the, the, the mode that you use on the Wandering Emperor if you flash her out on the opponent's turn right now, because what I'm finding is if I go, you know, I see that they're attacking in or whatever, so I throw the Wandering Emperor on the field, I exile their creature, they immediately kill it. And in that mm -hmm. capacity, you know, yeah, you, you dealt with a thing, you gained a couple points of life, and it is exiled, which is important for the, today's meta, as we talked about, but you just played a four mana removal spell, and like, that doesn't feel so good. No. However, if you get her down, make a little 2-2, and then next turn are able to do something crazy, like, now all of a sudden you've got something to do. And, like, you just have to be so careful in playing her appropriately, depending on the decks that you find yourself against, because burn is so prevalent. There's a lot of burn that does hit Planeswalkers right now, and so you just have to be so careful. But I'm with you. I think, you know, obviously she's amazing. Um, yeah, she is, and I agree, man. you got to... You got to really kind of um, prepare and understand what you're going to utilize her for. I mean, the possibility is going to be you're going to play the four exile and you're just going to lose it. Yeah. And you're right. that That's, that's an expensive exile spell. It is. It <laughs> but, really uh, is. But the fact that she can back and build an army, it's it, it becomes a card of situation, yes. which is what makes uh, Meat Hook so, so... Um, uh, important to the aggro decks it, it becomes a it becomes a card of situation is the board state so far wide on your opponent's turn that you need to use it as a sweeper or are you far and wide enough and now you're just going to lay it down and use it as insurance and it's going to be you know like um what was it the bata the battalion or whatever with uh where he, anytime a creature died it pings for one um, um, i know it, yeah bastion was it Bastion? Bastion? I think so. Bastion of Remembrance? Um, I don't remember. I myself. have no idea now, man. I probably shouldn't have brought it up. No, it's okay. It's that way. black card. I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's, it's that one black card. It's that but, one uh, black enchantment. No. 
it's the ping ability but also with meat hook is if it will depending on what your life total is you may throw it down as a board sweeper and get yourself back in the game with life total so yeah. so you know emperor wondering emperor is just a toolbox like meat hook it's yeah. it's situational and depending on where you need it so it's flexible in that in that manner and uh yeah, she's great, man. But uh, I'm I'm really curious to see where this goes in September because yeah, you know we're losing we're losing chariots, we're losing gold spans, we're losing aspirants, um, we're losing a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. It's there's... gonna be it's gonna be a crazy shakeup in September. It is, and it'll be a good thing. One of the like understated things that we're gonna be losing in terms of flexibility are the pathway lands. I mean, that's mm. something we need to consider because those pathway lands open up a lot of smooth plays that we may not be able to get. I mean, we'll still have some three color flexibility, of course, and even just down to two color flexibility, but that's going to start pinching some of that off. And that's something that we are going to have to consider as we move forward with the the land slot as well, once that, that does happen. But all that to say, um, you know, as it stands right now, I think it's great to be able to use this as kind of a pulse check on where we're at in the meta. And, you know, as you and I have talked plenty of times before, and, you know, you can look at this pattern with any new set, you get that aggro hit for a few weeks, some of them are going to still stick in the meta, but control will start taking over. Um, I think this is the real first sign that we're going to start hitting on that control hit very, very soon, because now people are expecting a lot of the aggro stuff. They hit the top eight, they're in the tier one slots, now we have to beat them. And so... I think you're going to see a lot of people deck building around beating aggro now that there's so many people just taking these net decking. They're taking these deck uh, yeah. lists and, and yeah. throwing them on the ladder. Yeah, no, yeah, they're getting comfortable with them. And it is, man. It's all about the adrenaline rush. You're getting out these aggro decks. It's yeah. it's instant gratification. I'm throwing down creatures and I'm punching you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of sadistic but you know that's magic <laughs> sometimes yeah. uh but no it does open the field for a control style to come in and just um i'm not saying the orzov list was perfect for it i think it would have absolutely trounced this field but yeah. uh there's plenty more out there man there's demir control builds there's mono black is in a good spot for control mm -hmm. um but the one thing i do think is uh my, I think my prediction is going to come to fruition here real soon, too. <laughs> what matches up against really well against these control decks is that Just Guy Storm list. Yeah, it does. Because yeah. it, it, can, it can fight its way out, and you oh, can yeah. mix it up with the March of the Swirling Mists, and we haven't even seen it with Slip Out the Back yet. Yeah. And, you know, you can add in a couple of Negates or Juari's Disruptions to it, which I think he was running three of. Um but, uh, yeah, I think this was kind of trying to see, you know, hey, I'm still having fun with it. Mid-range is a lot of fun just yeah. because of oh, the yeah. power size of what you can make your board style. But, uh, you know, Just Guy Storm and, and, and Hanada both <laughs> kind of let everybody know that they're still around. They and Goldspan, Goldspan is still Goldspan. Goldspan is <laughs> still Goldspan. Him, man, you him. can't get away from him. <laughs> Gold span is um, still the damn gold span. I will say, you know, as we're kind of coming to the end of talking about what won the top eight, one thing that I was, and, and you kind of brought it up, I'm surprised we didn't see an Invoke Despair deck in the top eight because Invoke Despair, has seen, it, lately at least, has just seemed like it's so prevalent. It seems like it's so good because it's an immediate, like, most likely it's going to replace itself in the hand and do more than that. Um, mm -hmm. and so at least, and so it's one of those where you just feel like it's such a good card. Why wouldn't you run it? Or why wouldn't it make the top eight? Um, do you feel like these decks that did make the top eight? I mean, most of them are kind of mid rangey or aggro -y style decks. Do you feel like they're just too fast for it and they outpace? Is that kind of the problem? No, I just don't think anybody's built it yeah. the way that it can take it, uh, take care. I mean, I could put it, look, I'm not, I'm a brewer. I'm not saying I'm a pro <laughs> or <laughs> anything, but I know enough that I could put a mono black or a Demir list yeah. to pull apart any of these deck lists. Um, Invoke Despair is a great card. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a mono black list go because mono black's got gas now. It's yeah, got it uh, Tenacious Underdog. It's got... Uh, 
it's got the shakedown heavy where you're either going to get punched in the face with a menace six four or you're going to untap it and let me draw a card so now mono black's got a lot of card draw going on the invoke despair and invoke despair could take care of the board state and then you got the meat hook masker sweepers and people will start you know, remembering the blood on the snow is still a thing, so you yeah. can bring back your planeswalkers. You could literally run mono black with maybe a three creature set of like eye twitch or shambling ghast. And if you run shambling ghast, you run deadly dispute, mm -hmm. or you got eye twitch and you got your lessons. And then you can run tenacious or tenacious underdog in the two slot, shakedown heavy in the three slot, and then just put you know in your infernal grasp, your Belfal masteries, your meat hook massacres, put in a couple sorens, a couple two three laws yeah. and then your blood on the snow is the top end to return any of that stuff and you've got a hell of a mono black control list for sure with the uh, with the invoke despairs and it's fast too because now yeah. you're just drawing 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 and you still got what's arguably the best creature land in mono black with hive of the eye tire yeah hive is very good and again important because of that exile ability so it's so crucial yeah, it's a mess, but uh, I like where Mono Black's at. I really do. Um, I think, like I said, I, I think I think we're we're gonna see more control this next time around. Now that people can kind of figure it out. Yeah. Um, but I don't think Invoke's gone. The one thing I would be real curious to see, and and I'll throw it out there as kind of a secret because it's something I've been working on in my head. Um, <laughs> running running a Grixis list. Yeah mono black but just with galvanic iteration or expressive iterations both so you can galvanic your uh, invoke despairs you know i've often thought that not in a deck list but just in thinking of like the possibilities of standard right now i'm because we do have a lot of copy abilities with those you know galvanic iteration and stuff it's like it seems like such a great idea is to just copy and invoke despair like why wouldn't you want to yeah. do that but well and you don't even have to get out of control with the colors no, you, don't you don't even have to put in the expressive iterations because you no. are still drawing off the invoke despairs and you know the, the, with the uh, shambling gas deadly dispute if you go that route or you're widening your play style with the eye twitch and the lessons but uh tenacious underdogs doing it and unless they can remove your shakedown heavy it's going to draw you cards as well yeah. and then of course soren and aloth both draw cards um you you can throw in grixis lands just to have that galvanic mm -hmm. iteration hit that invoke despair or that deadly dispute yeah you know and uh that may be enough fuel to the fire just to blow somebody out i th i th i think there's a lot of possibilities in control what's blowing my mind is blue is not the prevalent control right i now. know and i've often i mean i think too right now um and one of the ideas that i do want to play around with is a demir control list in particular because one of the underdog or not underdog cards but kind of like slightly under the radar cards uh is a very simple little cantrip but it's tainted indulgence which mm -hmm. it's a nice little instant speed way to draw a couple cards but it also fills up your yard with things like tenacious underdog which is perfectly fine yeah. to throw in your graveyard and you bring it back and it's like you know there's i'm not saying that that enables everything in the world or anything like that but it is a nice little synergistic play that opens you up to the blue side of things in a mostly mono black control list with the invoke despairs and stuff but it also keeps you on the instant speed end of things aside from invoke despair and tenacious underdogs so it's like you can kind of keep the counter heavy if you want or you can go mm -hmm. removal heavy but keep it all instant speed and then you've got plays you know wherever you need them um and that tainted and indul indulgence being able to to hit that at the end of your opponent's turn is kind of important in a deck like that i mean any any control deck wants that now the taint and indulgence um i think i know which one you're talking about i haven't used it that much i'm not a big fan of discarding cards um Weird. it's the two it's the two cups right draw two or draw yeah it's draw two discard one uh yes draw two it? cards then discard a card unless there are five or more cards uh mana values among cards in your graveyard yeah so again back to that idea of that grixis list you yeah. know um Xander is only a six cost and would fit right in with Blood on the Snow being able to reanimate it off of Tainted Indulgence, putting it in the bin. 
Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, you can get crazy with some builds out there. And I don't know if you've ever ran into a Xander. I've, I've been on the receiving end. It's not yeah. polite, man. I, uh, I got hit it's... with one in one of the reanimator decks. They reanimated a Xander and milled me for half my deck. And I was like, man, yeah. that's, well, that's I just, annoying. <laughs> yeah, I've sat there and let it happen. One, it doesn't feel very comfortable because no. I don't like people touching my stuff. And that's all that card does is I'm going to touch all your things. <laughs> and it's Whoa just now. like, God damn. Um... It really is, man. He's, I'm going to mill you. I'm going to wreck your board state. Yeah, I'm going to wreck everything. your I, it, Yeah, man. I, it, hmm. Very annoying. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. But yeah. uh, he is fun to watch. So oh, I he's sat a blast there and just kind of watched it and was like, you know, hey, good for you. You get to live the dream while yeah. I'm sitting here living the nightmare. But, uh, <laughs> No, yeah, man, well. I think there's a lot of open builds still out there. I don't know that we've seen the best. I think we've seen think we some have. really competitive aggro builds. Um, I think Hinata and Storm yeah. are still from, I mean, just from the from the the Neon Dynasty set. It's just kind of the bleed over of, yeah. of two of the really best decks that were in that style. And then we saw a bunch of... Uh, uh, streets of new capenna mid mid-range builds right come in but now i think now i think we're going to start to see you know i think just guy storms in a really good spot i think hanada's in a less of a a, a great spot it's still a great deck obviously right uh, especially with the with the person that can pilot it as flawlessly as it right. was this past weekend but uh um I think Storm's in a better spot than Hanada, especially when control comes in play. Because Storm, having played it a lot on my own, just goes so fast. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. It goes so fast. I can literally close games out and turn five, six at the most when I get just just those sweet draws. You know, yeah. As long as I've got big score in hand and it's pulling the cards I need, it's easy to close out a game really fast with Storm. Yeah. Hanada is a little bit build up, but, yeah, but once you're there, it, you can't. It's hard it's to almost disrupt impossible. because there's so much protection in that deck. Um, yeah. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that I would suggest is that you, we are going to start to see a lot more um, main deck disruption, I think, as things start to move forward in the meta because there are so many high value plays that it's like if you can spend two mana to deal with a four or five mana thing you're getting a mm. lot more value than you used to get out of countering something like that i mean power creep is a whole other topic and i won't get into too much of that but <laughs> you know you look at a card like a seekus chariot yep. that's an immediate three for one if you counter that um yeah i mean you know and that's that's a big deal right now because Asika's Chariot is such a good card. And so, and there's a lot of things. I mean, that's just an obvious, uh, you know, example, but there's so much of that that you got to start running some of these, you know, interruption pieces or interactive pieces that I don't think we're not seeing as much of the instant speed versions of those right now. I think we're still, we're seeing some obviously, but a lot mm. of it is to deal with more than one thing at a time. So you're seeing a lot of the meat hook massacres and things like that, which is also important. It's hard to stay ahead when you're one for oneing every time. But I do think at some point we're going to have to see a little bit more of that because I think right now it's pretty easy if you go unanswered with one or two things. All of a sudden it's really easy to take over a game because those one or two things are probably really really good things <laughs> like a lot of cards right now are just super crazy on the power level end yeah no i yeah i agree there's and the, like the chariot uh the one thing that i was kind of surprised with that the field showed me too is um people aren't really leaning into green quite as much as i thought they were going to uh workshop war chief made its you know yeah. made its way into the list and stuff like that but i mean where's the ramp side with topiary stomper that thing can i where's mean the tight of can, industry yeah that too as your top end but i mean topiary stomper can ramp you yeah and on your chariot turn you know if you had a way to give haste then you know you can uh, crew the chariot with think... the stomper and then your three cards are technically i mean man i don't know about the i i know what you're saying by three cards for the price of one yeah the value of chariots just absolutely gross but i think chariot and stomper go hand in hand yeah, uh, they do. i think 
I think a good Golgari list is still out there too. I think Shakedown Heavy and yeah. and Chariot could go crazy because you're either gonna let me draw cards or you're gonna let me crew my Chariot or you know. Well, and like um, the Titan Obnixilis combo and like stuff like that right oh, now yeah. is ridiculous. Um, yeah, but it's or not fight. it's not consistent enough yet. Right. Um, right. I think well, we'll, that's we'll why get we're there. that's why we'll probably never see fight rigging in a tournament is that yeah. word right there the consistency of it yeah you can pull cards um and look at them and put one under there for the hideaway effect and you can probably get it cast but yeah. it's the consistency of what cards am i going to pull yeah you never you know. know so i don't think we'll ever i think fight rigging is just a fun card i don't think it'll ever be a competitive card i love it but oh, uh too, yeah, yeah man i think there's still a lot out there that needs to be uh be worked on i I think we've got a lot of engines and possibilities that could drive decks a lot faster than especially since mid-range was the name of the game obviously even though it got beat out yeah um you might start seeing the mono whites pop up like crazy again or the boros aggros or the the mono green stompies and stuff like that but i think uh i think we're sitting in a point right now where now if you're a control player is the time to start taking it over because yep. uh, you kind of know where the field's going. And if mid range is where the field's going against control, they better get a hell of a lot faster because control yeah. can wreck mid range. They will annihilate some mid range decks for sure. Yeah. Um, well, there you go, guys. Build build control. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yes. all, all joking aside, uh, like, I, like we kind of talked about, this is a great pulse check on where the format's at right now. I do think there's a lot of room for growth, especially in that control aspect. So I'm expecting to see some of that over the next couple weeks. Um, but again, I just want to say a huge congratulations to everybody in the top eight. Jan, congratulations for taking it down with that Jeskai Hinata list. That's sick. Uh, and it is kind of cool to still see a, a few artifacts from the, the previous standard environment still hitting hitting home but uh congratulations to everybody that was an absolute blast of a tournament so um i hope everybody enjoyed it at the very least but uh i think we'll we'll start concluding we get to get to our uh little point where we just can talk about whatever we want so do you have a, a fun story or anything a fun story for this week yeah and um <laughs> i'm trying to think so our oldest okay yeah i do i told you yesterday when we were texting back and forth trying yeah. to set up a time this week um our oldest son popped up to a visit just and he does this man he, he lives in missouri so yeah. he pops up every once in a while just randomly <laughs> and uh not real <laughs> random he tells his mom <laughs> i just find out second hand when he's walking in the door um but he pops up and spends a couple days and then heads back and goes back to work just to kind of get a breather and stuff and uh yeah it was funny because we were setting up i think monday night after stream drinking beers and no it was sunday night not even on stream <laughs> and uh we were setting out we 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 usually get our time to later at night um once mom goes to bed and uh em and went to bed so we were drinking the beers and he brought up the uh, biscuits and gravy god i'm trying to remember all of this <laughs> um but yeah the kids man they always have their favorite foods oh, yeah. and one of his is the biscuits and gravy so i cook this sausage gravy spicy oh, sausage gravy and biscuits in the morning and oh, they god. none of none of them eat breakfast man but if i cook this they're all <laughs> eating breakfast john i need to come and eat breakfast at your there place you go, man. <laughs> there you go there you go but uh yeah he he got his biscuits and gravy um most of them want the chicken alfredo that i yeah. make i mean it's just yeah but it was funny man because he, he did we were sitting there talking magic and talking football and then next thing i know it was like hey so could you make some i haven't had biscuits and gravy in forever <laughs> You know, it'd be really good some biscuits and gravy. Some biscuits and <laughs> so, gravy. Yeah. Please. So, there you I go, love man. that, man. That's awesome. Gosh. I do. I have a soft spot for biscuits and gravy. So genuinely, it's... when we finally see each other in person for the first time, um, Absolutely. first of all, I'll make it. that's going to be a magical moment. But yeah, man, it's going to be great. Well, you'll make biscuits and gravy. I'll make something that I know how to make. I don't know what. It'll be great. 
<laughs> I'll figure something less out. than 30 minutes, man. It is oh. the most homey breakfast you'll ever have ever. I love biscuits and gravy. Such good yeah. stuff. Um, so easy. Well, I will say, uh, I don't have any like crazy fun stories this week. Uh, this week has been extraordinarily busy, as you and I were talking about, with work and all that stuff. So I haven't really had much time for fun. Um, however, this past weekend, uh, Caitlin and I, so we live in like a little town home and it's like a two bedroom thing. And so we have our master bedroom and then we've always had a spare bedroom, which is also where the office space has been. Uh, and you'll notice there's a little window you can't see this john but there's a window behind oh, me you know what's happening i know what happened so there's a window behind me which is where my desk used to be and where the desk is now was a giant like queen sized bed frame which took up half the room and we have people stay here maybe like two weeks out of the year like collectively i'm not saying all at once like normally it's a night here or there and it might add up to two weeks and so I was like kind of looking at redoing the office space and like seeing what I could do. I've ended up replacing like my monitor setup and everything. But I uh, I asked Caitlin one day, she got home from work and she was telling me about our day and I very rudely interrupted her and I was like, Caitlin, I have an idea and I just need you to hear me out. And if you, if you nix it, it's fine. Don't, don't worry about it, but hear me out. And she was like, uh, okay, like super caught off guard. And I was like, <laughs> what if we got a pull-out couch instead of right. that bed frame? And she was like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And I was like, oh, thank fucking God. I was so worried. Um, <laughs> yeah, <man. No. laughs> so uh, we ended up getting a couch, and we're, we have to ditch the bed frame still because we found it was broken in places anyway. Um, so we went online. We ordered a couch uh, because we're lazy millennials, and that's easier <laughs> than going somewhere. And so we found a couch on amazon it came in two days later because prime is amazing and in fact it's right under the window you can see just a blur of it over there but uh turns out it's not a pull-out couch it's just a regular couch <laughs> um so <laughs> we like unboxed it that thing was heavy as shit too so i got it upstairs and, like, I, I had to take it up in pieces. I was like, there's no way I'm getting this up. Caitlin is going to be next to not. I mean, it's it's heavy. So, like, I didn't want her to lift it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to bring this up in pieces. So I start taking it out of the box. It was, like, three or four different pieces. No screws hold this thing together. It's all just tensioned little things. It's, like, super cheapo. But it looks really nice. And so we're like, ah, we'll just keep it. We'll just bring the mattress out. We, we did keep the mattress. Yeah. So we'll just bring that out if people need to stay here. There you go, man. Yeah, look, we, we we've got spare bedrooms because of the kids. Yeah. But uh you know, and they keep funneling out the house at a <laughs> rapid speed. So that's awesome. <laughs> we've just got spare bedrooms now. Um no, but uh <laughs> yeah, I mean we we keep uh one of those queen size uh air mattresses. That's yeah, that's a great idea. That's like, you know, it's like two feet. <laughs> Yeah. deep and it's just a queen size man and what's great is most people come over in the summer here mm -hmm. to visit and if you've ever slept on an air mattress those things stay cold as hell they do so, yeah so they're amazing it works perfect but no now we've got enough bed space anybody yeah. can just take up whatever room they want it's yeah. just funny because my brother will come over and he'll be like can i have the other mattress because he sleeps hot man yeah. he just sleeps hot he's yeah. just like i don't want the bed can i have the air mattress i don't yeah. want the bed whatever, bro, whatever <laughs> but before i do forget yeah um not to completely go off that, but if you were getting ready to lock up so uh, and close down shop here, yeah. um, I got the sneak peek Top Gun. Oh, what? Yeah. Well, you know, my retired thing. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. It, okay. it, it eventually has some perks every once in a while, but I got the sneak peek Top Gun. And uh, yeah, good? Equally, equally. Okay. Sick. That's good. So definitely check it out. And uh skip purge forever. And if you guys watch it yet, so the it purge? was horrible. Purge forever. Oh no. I hate yeah, those it was movies. Bad, man. I I'm not like so like I I'll classify that as like a obviously a scary slash like dramatic movie. Obviously there's a lot of like tension and all that stuff in those yeah, movies. Yeah, it's just a big gore fest. Yeah, like there I don't get freaked out by a lot of stuff like 
you know, I used to watch Saw as an example, and like mm-hmm. I, it didn't bother me. Like it's a movie, it's very fake, it's whatever. What really freaks me out is when I see people doing stuff that I feel like they're capable of, but they very clearly shouldn't. And that's like yeah. all that the purge is. That is, man. So the first one was fine. It was, it was intense. Okay. Yeah, and I, I was it. like, okay, I see your concept. You're going there. Saw is a completely different experience. I watch it because I just want to see how the traps go off. Honestly, <laughs> so yeah. That's like, kind of my like, thing, too. I used to think that was so freaking cool. Um, but but no, Top Gun, Top Gun. And then if you haven't seen it yet, uh, another suggestion would be, every, uh, what is it? It's uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh, I saw that. Or I saw previews yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah, very good. But good. that's it, man. That's all oh, I got. That's so I've been I rewatching. Do you watch Studio Ghibli fil- films? Like anime films? Um. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very particular about which ones I watch. Uh, Probably the newest thing that I've enjoyed. um, Well, I don't know, man. I can't say that. I was going to say Death Note, and that's not very new. No, it's not. uh, Death Note was really good, though. Dude, I've watched it like damn 10 times, bro. All the way through. It's not that long, too. So, like, you can binge that in a couple days, and you're so stoked. It's pretty long, bro. No, it's, <laughs> it's not pretty that long. long. <laughs> I like the Castlevanias that got released on Netflix. Okay. Um, there was some other Parasite, I think, was one yeah. where the thing came out of his hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm I'm more of an old school Ninja Scrolls, Fist of the North Star, okay. Ghost in the Shell. Ghost um, in the Shell is great, yeah. Yeah, but and it's got about a bajillion it's got more spin-offs than an x-man comic yeah right dude now, it's so. ridiculous um, but go ahead i'm sorry no no, no. i was just gonna say i've been like re-watching because i i love the studio ghibli films you know like spirited away obviously my neighbor mm-hmm. totoro um uh how's moving castle is a favorite nausicaa valley of the wind like all those are just things i watched as a kid and so naturally i still love the nostalgia factor So, like, just this week, I know I I mentioned it's been a really busy week and I've been working a lot, which just means for me, I'm sitting at this desk doing a bunch of crap on the computer. (laughs) And so I have my other computer over here, which I usually use for, like, music production and whatever. So I just pulled up Prime, though, and I was like, I wonder if these are on here. And so I just started, like, once a day, I'll buy a film and I'm like, all right, that's the one I'm watching today. And it's all just been, you know exactly what i said spirited away house moving castle yeah. nausicaa um i was looking today for uh castle in the sky um like just all those like old school studio ghibli films some of them are more old school than others but um i love them and if you haven't seen your name uh I, that came out years ago but dude the animation in that movie it's not a studio ghibli film but it it's is called your name it's literally just called your name oh my okay. god i get like okay here's the thing it's like it's a love story and so it kind of tries to pull at the heartstrings a little bit and it's really good at it and like the story is really interesting and compelling and stuff but being a graphic designer holy mm-hmm. fucking shit the animation in that movie is amazing yeah no it's stunning I'm... I'll definitely check it out. And Spirited Away and House Moving Castle. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, man, I think, like I said, I just, I have a real particular I get taste you. in them. No it, and, and it's got to be a, it's got to be a really easy storyline for me to follow. Cause I've tried okay, Dragon Ball Z. Maybe don't watch your name. <laughs> okay, well, no, you should. Well, but... I mean, I say that, but some of my favorite films jump around like crazy. Yeah. Um, but uh I think my anime style also went over in my cooking style, uh, cooking show styles too, because I cannot watch Iron Chef America to save my life, and I yeah, absolutely I hate like it. it. I hate it. I don't like it. But I'll go on Tubi and watch every season of, of Iron Chef Japan <laughs> from the '90s, bro. <laughs> I love it, dude. I That's love amazing. it. Amazing. I love it. I guilty pleasure TV show for me is Great British Baking Show. I'm not yeah. really yeah. into cooking. I mean, I like cooking. It's really fun. Um, and I do enjoy it quite a bit when, you know, we're making dinner and stuff and breakfast. But, like, I'm not that big into cooking. I hate watching, like, the competitive cooking shows. Mm-hmm. But something about the Great British Baking Show just doesn't feel competitive. They're all just like, oh, we're happy to be here. If yeah. it's, you know, 
if we go home, it's fine. We're all good. And your, then there's like Noel in the background. Like shite. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's Noel in the background just making old Greg jokes and stuff. And then you're like, all right, sick. Yeah, I'm right. into this. Um, but yeah, I love no, it. No, I like it. I like it. It's a good one. But yeah, man, Iron Chef Japan. And then now look, I do love cooking, but I'm not cooking damn sea cucumbers and stuff like no. that. <laughs> so, no. or, or, you know, uh, what, what they have on there that one that I watched last night, I think it was uh, uh, the the stingrays oh, God. and you can only really do i mean you can use them to make a soup broth but you usually only use the cheap yeah. uh fillets off of them but yeah man i love that and it was so uh back in the 90s i mean that was right about the time when the first mortal Kombat came out and it just kind of <laughs> i mean God. it kind of turned mortal Kombat into a cooking show but yeah. people don't die but it's yeah <laughs> i love it i love well. it dude but yeah all that to say, all over the place. there no, we go, man. Okay. We we we, we, we dove into so much. We did it's so little time right there. That was amazing, <laughs> um, guys. I just want to say a huge thank you again to everybody who <laughs> supports the channel, the podcast, the streams, the videos. It all does really mean a lot to us. So thank you guys so much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know we rambled a little on the end there, and <laughs> it was worth it. Uh, congratulations again to all the top eight winners of the new Capenna Championship. An absolute blast to see where we're at with the meta. Uh, and again, just awesome to see you guys and the variety of deck lists that we're getting here. So congratulations. That is going to wrap up today's episode, though. Uh, so with that, we'll get out of here. I hope you guys have a glorious day. Peace. Yes. There you go. <laughs>